You couldn't call it the Outback if the roads were awesome, but then, that's always been part of the charm for me. The road out to Port Keats slowly but surely gets rougher and rougher as you head further west. This land is like a country within a country. Port Keats only has a population of 2,500, the majority of them Aboriginal, and these roads are completely closed off in the wet, isolating this already isolated community completely. Drive on these roads long enough, and you're guaranteed to pay the piper one way or another. We were paying the price again and again with the boat trailer. This time, it was a blown hub. These things get a bit of dust in them, and then slowly tear themselves to pieces. I always carry a couple of ready-assembled full spares, though. Distance is a funny thing. In a way, it defines our perception of the realm around us as much as the colors, the smells, and the other more tangible aspects of our sensory world. There's a weightlessness that comes on when you are a million miles from home. It induces a kind of cosmonaut syndrome, that peculiar insight we are granted when everything is presented in a grand scale. I can feel it as we roll into Port Keats, known as Wadair to the locals. This is a world removed, a distant outpost at the edge of the known world. No man is an island, but some places on the map still feel strange and cut off. Split between the distant past and today, Wadair is home to a singular museum, collating a unique collection of local lore and artifacts, and a singular man behind it, Mark Crocom. Father Doherty is credited with uh, founding Wadair or Port Keats. When did he get here and, and why did he do that? Uh, it was cooperative effort, all the Aboriginal people and the missionaries working together. There'd been some problems around the area, Few people got speared here and there, Japanese fishermen in the early 30s, and then other people were leaving the area going to the farms at Daly River. And the farmers were complaining there were too many bush Aboriginals coming into their farms. So they asked the bishop, Couldn't you start a mission in the Port Eats area somewhere, try and hold the drift? So in 1934, they talked about it in Darwin. So that's why the mission was started, to try and halt the drift of Aboriginal people to the settled areas. And that was going till basically around the 1950s. Father Leary came after Doherty in 58, and he was more culture as well as religion. That seems to be the case now. I've seen a lot of the kids running around, obviously with uh, Christian shirts and things like that, but they're still very much embracing their Aboriginal culture as much as they know how to. Yeah, they, they like going to the cultural sites. I've just been at Bush four days doing connecting children with country and culture. See, we used to take, the old people used to show us around. It's up to us now to work with the older people my age and then all the kids and the grandchildren to show them the places I've been fortunate to see as a young girl. You're like a de facto elder. Oh, just by accident. The past and the present chase each other's tails here in a never-ending, swirling, yin-yang dance. In 1928, an Aboriginal man had murdered a dingo trapper on Coniston Station further south. The settlers were using permanent water holes for their cattle, which the Aboriginals depended upon in times of drought. Over 60 Aboriginals were targeted in reprisal killings. A mere five years later, a Catholic mission was set up in Port Keats to quell the natives, who were seen as barbaric to the whites trickling into the north. They coaxed the Aboriginals off the land with sugar and tobacco, and began to inculcate them with Western ideologies, slowly but inexorably assimilating the population into a manageable mess. In 1948, a convent and school was built just outside of town on the coast. I don't think there's a greater dichotomy than that which existed in the culture clash that happened when the Christians arrived on Australian shores. These missionaries brought with them some great things, medicine and education. But along the way, they stomped all over a culture that had existed virtually unchanged for nearly 50,000 years here. And you can see that really clearly here at the Port Keats Convent. This old building here is where the nuns came to spread the good word. Now in this building, that's the sacred ground. This country around here though, is what's sacred for all of the Aboriginals. And that's a big difference. The building had to be blessed, but for the Aboriginals, every inch of ground is special and sacred and they have a really close bond to the landscape. And that's what the missionaries basically destroyed when they came here, that holistic view of the world where man is intimately connected to the trees, the ground, and the water. 
More and more, both the Aboriginals and the Whitefellas are going back to the land now and finding that old connection. 